One for everybody, if they don't already have one. All right. Welcome, everybody. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this class, and thank you for all that you're teaching us. Father, please help us to come to know you, the one true God. Because, Father, it doesn't matter if we learn history, if we learn anything else. It's about knowing you, the great rehabilitator, the one who saved us, the one who came to earth, the one who continues to live in us, the one who's not leaving us as orphans. But you give us spirit that we can continue to grow in you. Father, please help us to understand your word. And we just commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And if you don't have, she's passing out the packet if you don't have it. Now, I apologize. This packet is, lo- is bigger. Okay, I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I kept writing, right? Yeah, yeah you know, co- it's, yeah, well, college course credits will be given for this. Uh, but, however, the thing is, the fourth century was the most prolific century. And I use the word prolific. If you don't know what prolific means, it means, it's kind of like, think of a, fr- a fruit tree, a prolific fruit tree would be one that has lots of fruit growing on it. So tons of stuff was happening. So it was the most prolific century, the fourth century. Huge amount of stuff happened. So I wrote a lot more history on there, and I also added something from Cyprian on the lost, uh, the lapse, I should say. All right, so let's get going. So we're going to be talking about persecution, Constantine, and change. Persecutions in the early church. Now, contrary to what everybody thinks, the church was not constantly persecuted. Okay, there were times that it was worse than others. Sometimes it got bad. Sometimes it got better. There was, you know, certain areas were worse, you know. And so we've got to understand that it wasn't a constant thing. I mean, we think about everybody being fed to the lions and, you know, burned at stakes. and And they did do that. We'll get into that. But it wasn't continuous. And the good news is, I don't think, if it was continuous, I don't think a lot of people would have came. So God allowed it, and the church, interestingly enough, the church usually grew when the persecutions grew. Interesting. But now, the first one really went under Nero, but the first true persecutions was in Acts, the book of Acts. The Jews persecuted the Christians in the beginning. Okay? The Jews persecuted the Christians. We know that's where Paul came from, right? Paul was on his way on the road to Damascus. He was heading to Damascus to go persecute some more Christians when God met him and said, hey, hey, what are you doing, dude? Come with me. I got, we got things to do. And we're not going to Egypt, by the way. So, because, you know, everything has to go to, everybody's got to go to Egypt. All right. So, Nero. Now, Nero was really the first real major persecution. Now, when I say persecution, don't think empire-wide. It'd be like persecution in D.C. It was only in really in Rome for the most part that this truly happened with Nero. Nero was a crazy dude. This dude was nuts. You know, so he, was, he really kind of did his own thing. He, uh, he liked to play the harp. He did all kinds of weird stuff. But the thing is, what happened is, is that this Rome, the city of Rome burned. And about, it was like four, about like Four-fifths of it was destroyed. Interestingly enough, that, now that, that's, that's, you know, yeah, four-fifths of it's destroyed. Interestingly enough, this, what was the bad thing about it was the only places that were left were Christian and Jews' homes. That didn't endear them too much to the Romans. However, we know, we, we believe and Tacitus, the great historian, even basically said about Nero, he said, I think Nero's the one who actually started this thing. The guy was crazy. He literally was nuts. So, but the thing is, they believe that, that actually, he didn't come out truly and say that Nero did it, but he believed he did it. And I think, yeah, that's, it's, you know. But however, it, whether Nero did it or not, doesn't really matter. So regardless if he fi- started the fire or not, Nero did not want to be blamed because the first thing that people that realize is because the guy was crazy and the guy really wasn't really trustworthy, the people went and blamed him first. They didn't blame the Christians first. They blamed him. And so what Nero did, and according to Tacitus, 
that Nero kind of said, wait a minute, yeah, everybody, all this stuff burned, but Jews and Christians' homes didn't burn, so guess who started the fire? So Nero directed it at the Christians, and then went and took his wrath out on the Christians and the Jews. Now remember, in this time, you've got to understand, when we say, by this is around 64 AD, we're only about 30 years after Jesus or so. So when we talk about this time, we've got to understand that Christianity and Judaism, according to the Roman mindset, were together. They had a hard time seeing one from the other. Now this would get, after about AD 70, when the temple was destroyed and the Jew, problems with Jews, Christians began to really separate themselves from the Jews. That's when Rome started seeing it as different. Okay? But for the most part, Christians and Jews are pretty much kind of put together in the Roman mind during this time. And so people kind of went after both of them. So what he did is he basically put them on crosses and burned them. He would, like the, he, would, he would have them going down the streets on fire. People would be on crosses, Christians and Jews, and he would light them on fire, and they would, they would you know, because the idea is saying, well, they started the fire, we're going to start our fire. So, sadly, sad but true. So that was a pretty bad one. Now, we also know, uh, we believe that, that Nero actually uh, assassinated two of the apostles. They, Paul and Peter, they believe was assassinated Rome with this, but not during, the, not during this time, it was actually afterwards, a few years later. Okay, so we do know Paul, both Peter and Paul were both assassinated in Rome around that time, a little bit after. All right, Trajan. Now Trajan was, uh, Trajan was an interesting guy. Before Trajan, there was some sporadic persecutions of Christians, but what Trajan did was something different. He basically said as an empire-wide statement, if you find the Christians are not doing good, go get them. But don't just go out and persecute them. Now, we've got to remember, this is interesting. We, meet, we think these guys are just a bunch of crazy people back there, but they were still under law and authority. Does anybody know, remember which people taught law and authority the best? Who were the people that taught it the best before the Romans? Anybody? Greeks, absolutely. Remember, they were highly influenced by Hellenism. Now, granted, we know that before the Greeks, it was the Code of Hammurabi and that kind of stuff that taught law. But the key was is they wanted to try to at least go into things of law. So they weren't as crazy as we think they are. They actually were they were somewhat, somewhat civilized, not really, but somewhat. Now, but the thing is, is what Trajan does say is, okay, if you see that these guys are doing this, then you go get them. Sadly, what happened because of that is, the, is that, is that you know, if a leader doesn't like the Christians, that just said, well, they, these guys did bad, so they started going after them. Some of the great apologetical work that happened in the early church was written to the Caesars to tell them, hey, stop doing this to us. You guys got to stop this thing. This is not good. Because depending on what part of the Roman Empire we're talking about, there were persecutions breaking out here and there. So in Trajan, they basically said, well, hey, Trajan says if you're doing this, 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 and this, then you work, then go get them. So like, just like we learned a couple weeks ago, the Roman, I mean, the Christians took Romans 13 to heart. Think about it. If you're going to be persecuted because you break a law, What's the best thing to not do? Break a law. So Christians became the best citizens. That's why Christians were such great citizens. Because, but it wasn't just this, because they also believe what the Bible says. Now, you've got to remember, Christians were very focused on the words of, of Paul in the Gospels. They were very much aware of all of that, and they, they wanted to emulate those things. So when Paul wrote to the Romans about this, the Christians really did take this seriously. Okay? Now, again, this is what we need to learn as Christians because what better way can we witness to people than if we're good citizens? If we're driving, shouting to go to this people, like last night I was, I was at my other job at the gym and I got mad at this guy and I was kind of grumpy and I realized, so I'm like, you know, what if this guy was watching my YouTube, the YouTube and watching me free? And I thought about that going, 
you know, but, but see, the, 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 it's the thing. It's like, you know, wait a minute, I don't really want to do these things because if I am, a, if I am you know, an ambassador for Jesus, I really want to make sure that people see Christ in me. I want to make good decisions when I go out. And that's really what they did. Persecutions would go intermittently for the next 150 years under those guys. So those guys were the big ones. You know, they're different Caesars. So, and again, it all really depending on, it really was depending on who the Caesar was. Also, remember, there was also a big God complex problem with the Caesars. Some Caesars were just, they thought they were, they were, I'm God, you need to worship me. You remember the old, remember kind of like the original Caesars were, they kind of like thought they were really like gods in a sense. The problem was, depending on who it was, they'd go after the Christians. So, but it wasn't, wasn't happening all the time. Now, granted, they were pretty nasty to, see, to the people. They were nasty. They would send, you know, put them in the Colosseum. Now, think about this. They had put them in the Colosseum, and, and wild animals would go after them and stuff. But let me ask you this. What's the di we think that we're horrified by that. What's the difference between watching that and watching a, an action movie that has a lot of killing in it? Not a lot. So we shouldn't think these guys were all bad. They weren't good, the Romans were doing that. But don't we kind of sometimes do the same thing? I don't know. I'm just kind of, that's just my thought of the week. All right. Persecutions produced martyrs. Ah, this is a key thing. The persecution, one of the, thing, one of the things we have to remember throughout history is whenever you persecute people and kill people, it produces a martyr. Martyr means that, hey, I died for my faith, my cause. The more they died for that, the more people saw and say, wow, these guys were awesome, which brought more Christians in. That's a key, into, that's a key point right there. Remember that. It's going to bring more Christians in the more people are martyred. So, but what happened was it was literally thought to be the, the greatest achievement a Christian could do is to be martyred. Sadly, what would continue on as the empire went along, some people went out and got martyred for nothing. They just like, I want to go get martyred, and they did it. The church kind of said, that's not a good idea. That's not the best way to do that. But people did that. Now, what happened was the people looked up to them. They were the, they were the heroes of the Christian church. They were the guys that, you know, they, along with the monks, uh, when, when we get to the 4th century that you guys are going to read about, that's the priestly class, and they created a hierarchy of Christians. This was not good. Basically, some Christians are better than others. Some Christians are way, ooh, they're way up there. They also did some kind of, they also, some of the people in the church did some bad magical stuff. They would take the bones of the martyrs and keep them with them. They would disinter their bones and keep them in their church thinking that the bones themselves might... Now, not, don't think this way for everybody. They were not all the church, and most of the church fathers said, that's really dumb, don't do that. But people did kind of start doing that during this time. They started thinking, ooh, if I just have this. Now, I mean, we know that very true, because all you have to do is watch the movie Indiana Jones, okay? When, when he goes after the, the grail... And, he went, and if anybody's watched that movie, they know that the grail holds power and it gives life. And it gives, that was kind of came out of all that. The idea is that kind of stuff. The grail is like, oh, we get the grail. You got life forever. As if it's some magical power outside of God. But that kind of did happen with that. So, but the problem was, within a few centuries, these people sadly begin to pray to the heroes. Well, they're, they're up there in heaven and well, I'm not that great of a Christian, so maybe if I pray to them, maybe something good will happen. So what happened was these guys were classified as saints. Now, we're going to talk at the very end about really what is a saint, because the Bible says we're all saints, and we'll get into that. But the thing is, because, since the saints were very close to God in life, maybe they could pray to God for us when they die. Ooh, maybe this saint over here, if I pray to him, he could go and ask God, because you know God's going to listen to him or her, because they were martyred, or they were a monk, or they were a priest, or they were this, they were the preacher, great guys. So the problem is, that's where they get the thing, the community of saints. Now, 
that's not exactly, this, that's the way they later interpret the communion of saints. From the, remember we read that in the, the um, creed, the communion of saints? The communion of saints is, like, the original fathers saw a little bit differently than that. But that's kind of where it went to. Heroes, the saints, the wonderful people. So communion of saints and praying to the dead. So don't think, you know, they actually took the community saints to the next level. And what they did, they took from one of the apocryphal books. This is one of the problems we have in the early church. There were books called the Apocrypha. Now, I covered those when we were in intertestamental period. If you guys went through that, if you haven't seen those, please go, go to YouTube and watch the intertestamental period. I'm covering the Apocrypha. We're going to what all those books do, do and what they were. But the key is that that... Athanasius basically said, and remember Athanasius, this guy is the guy who actually told her, said, well, let's put the Bible like this, and everybody consented and said, that's a good idea. Athanasius was great. He was an awesome dude. But what he said about the Apocrypha, he said, well, we, what you really need to do in the Apocrypha is read it in your closet, because it's not biblical, but it's something good to read down, you know, as general information. Even Athanasius knew that. Sadly, though, that they, they continue to put the Apocrypha in the Bible for many years, even though it wasn't really not considered genuine. And we more found that out later on, that the that writings were really not considered genuine. So, but this is actually from the book of 2 Maccabees. Or he would have not expected the fallen to rise again. It would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But... If he did this, pray to the dead, that is, with a view and splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was holy and pious thought, meaning that he, by praying them, that was a holy, pious thing. It was not bad. It wasn't really saying to do it, but thus he made an atonement for the dead that they might be absolved from their sin. Okay, now... You read that and you're going, what the heck? Now you got to remember that during the intertestamental period, it was, they did a lot of writing. But the key with this is that if you look at the last thing, second century BC of Jews do not consider this book as scripture. The apo none of the apocryphal books, even the Jews themselves, because remember, they're the ones who wrote them. They today do not even... So, and I think that's a good point to understand for ourselves. If the Jews who wrote them don't ex consider them to be biblical, then probably we shouldn't either. And we don't. So, because of this kind of stuff, that right there was taken... In later on in the church, in the you know, fifth, sixth, seventh centuries, later on it got into there and people started praying for the dead. And praying not only for their dead. Now, I will go more into this later on. Okay, we'll get into this more later on when, that, when they started doing that and how they begin to do it and stuff like that. But I just wanted to introduce you guys to it today that this is not what the Bible says. Now, I will say the sad part is they did not take the Apocrypha out of the King James Version. Yes, it was in the King James Version until around the late 17th century, 1800, about, about the 1700s. They continued, but, but finally the, the, the um, Protestant church said, this stuff is crazy. It don't work. It's not really there. We can't really trust it. And so they took it out. Now, unfortunately... We can learn a lot from, this, from these books, like Maccabees. It teaches us about the intertestamental period and helps us to understand. So it's good information. You just can't think of it as scripture. But I want to make sure everybody understands that. So if they've heard before about the Apocrypha, the reason why they call it the Apocrypha means, basically means read it in your closet. It's not really, it, and Athanasius basically said, read it in your closet, just don't read it in the church. That's what Athanasius says, which... That's a good point, and I think, I think he's correct. It's not bad to read, just don't use it as scripture. All right, now, but this is what, now I took this from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So what this says is, this is the earliest statement of doctrine that prayers and sacrifices for the dead are efficacious. 
Yikes, that's scary. So what basically what they mean, they believed it. And they still do. Judas, Judas, that's Judas Maccabees. That's the guy who wrote it. Probably intended his purification offering to ward off punishment from the living. The author, whoever used the story, to demonstrate the belief in the resurrection of the just and that possibility of expiration for the sins of otherwise good people who have died. This belief is similar but not quite the same as the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. We will get into purgatory later. But the key is, is that the Catholic Church, that's from Catholic, uh, Catholic bishops, uh, I think it was like written about within 10, 20 years ago. It's, so they still believe it. So they still believe that. But the, again, the problem is, is that these books are not really, really supposed to be you know, used. All right, let's move on. All right, Diocletian. Diocletian. Now, this is where the persecutions really took place. This is the big guy. This was the guy who did the most damage. He did a lot of damage to the... So, Rome was in trouble, and you're, that one of the reasons why... And if you don't have one of these, we can, you can get one at the end. One of the reasons why I wrote so much in here this time is because there was so much that went on, and I don't have time to go into it, It'll, everything will be explained in my thing here. So I'm sorry it's a lot of reading. Please forgive me for doing that. But uh, it's gonna, you'll understand when you read it all. It's going to be explained. But the thing is that Diocletian, the pro, there was a lot of problems in Rome. They went through 22 emperors in a short time. When I'm talking a short time, we're, not, we're talking like around 20 years. The lifespan of an inch, emperor could, could be about four months really scary, scary. Rome faced widespread colonial descent, civil wars for the first time. So one of the things we're gonna, you're going to see for next week when we go with the fall of the Roman Empire, I'm going to have a bunch of stuff of what led up to that. And really it was Rome had a lot of problems. But what Diocletian, who, he really wasn't the first to blame Christians, but the problem was he started realizing that, wait a minute, if we're losing battles, and Rome is losing territories, and we have problems with our emperors, we must have made the gods mad because we've been allowing Christians to live here and teach the people. Because people taught that Roman gods don't do anything for you. They're nothing. So Diocletian says, well, we got to change that. We've, maybe if we started persecuting these guys, then the gods will be happy with us again, and thus they'll come and favor us again, and Rome will become great. Now, Rome was, still at this time, Rome was pretty great here. He was pretty awesome. There just been a lot of problems. So what he did is he began to persecute Christians and other mystery religions. So mystery religions are like um, Zoroastrianism, uh, Judaism, whatever, most of your monotheistic religions. So it wasn't just Christians that he went after. He went after Jews. He went through Zoroastrians. I hope I'm saying that right. I always say that word wrong, but, but that was another uh, mostly monotheistic religion. Many, Christ, many, did Christ, uh, many did Christians did nothing for the empire. Basically, the key is, is that if they killed the Christians, it's not going to help them. He learned. Because remember, what do martyrs produce? What do martyrs, what is martyrs, what do we just talk about martyrdom? What does martyrdom do? Brings more Christians in. Yeah. Yeah, brings more Christians. Start dying for your faith. You start just showing this. You show the, 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 your faith and your desire to do that. People are like, oh, that's cool. So what he did is he said, all right, we're not going to kill them. We're just going to torture them to the point where they recant, meaning they're going to come back. They're going to, they're going to, all we want them to do, all we want them to do is say, go emperor, we love the emperor, and we're leaving Jesus. That's all they wanted. They said, we're just sign the form, we recant for an instance the emperor, you're good. But I will say that the problem is, in, I don't know if anybody's ever studied much about torture, but I've, I've read a lot of books and there was a lot of stuff about torture. One of the things that, that most people say is that eventually everybody breaks, or most everybody. However, I will say that, that historically, who do you think lasted longer in torture, males or females? Absolutely. Females, 
they lasted long. Most, a lot of times, the females did not turn. Now, what happened was they would torture them for days, and then they would let them go. People would then die after, a few days later. But that wasn't martyrdom, because of, actually, they didn't see that the, the, what they did to them, the people didn't see that what they did to them was murder. What they saw they did was torture, and they let them go. But even though, if they died, even though they died a couple days later, people still went back and said, well, that's not really martyrdom. So that's what they did. So what was worse, though, is when the people not only recanted, but they sold out their families. Oh, I got family members that are Christian. Go get them. Just leave me alone. And their preachers, pa their preachers pastors, they also sold them out. And manuscripts were destroyed. Now, I'm going to tell you, we're, they, we're missing manuscripts that we know were, that used to be there that we believe was destroyed because we know in early, earlier writings, we say that they, they mentioned these manuscripts. We don't know what happened to them. A lot of what, what happened to some of these manuscripts, they were destroyed during Diocletian's reign. So, so really important stuff. The Bible was burned. All these manuscripts were burned. And so that's one of the reasons why we no longer have the original writings from Paul and Peter and that's like, maybe, I'm not saying this is for sure, but a lot of it could have happened during this time. So what they did is they destroyed the manuscripts. These people were called the lapsed. But don't be too critical on them. Because how many of us would actually not give in after torture? Now we're talking, these guys, they weren't just nice. What they would do is they would flay your skin and they'd throw you in a, in a thing of manure, and you would and you would die, and you would writhe in because the bacteria would get inside your body. It would it was evil. They I mean these guys these guys were good at their job. So I'm I, to be honest, I probably would end up recanting. I'm not saying I would, but I'm just I don't want to say I wouldn't because the reality is is we don't know what these people actually went through. It was hard. So they were called the lapsed. So now here's the problem. What do we do in the church when the persecution stops? What do we do with these people? How do we bring them back? What do we do? Well, one of the things I added in your thing is Cyprian, in about 275 to 80, wrote a book on, on the lapsed. And I, I, re, I gave you some select articles, select reading from his work on what to do. He actually says... We need to have mercy and bring them back and do this. Then we have guys like the Donatists who would say, no, we're not going to let, because they burned manuscripts. The, what they did is they, again, the hierarchy of Christians, if you burn manuscripts, that's worse than just giving in. If you sold out, you know, bishops or pastors or preachers, that's worse. And so the Donatists would say, no, we want them to do all these things to try to get them back. There was a whole way of people trying to get, bring people back. All right. So the idea was, in the end, they, the church had a big problem on their hands. We'll call them this more later on. So Diocletian also... Now, Diocletian really is down in history as a great emperor. Okay? I mean, I know the Christians are like, Woo! That, guy, that guy's evil. But the reality was, he actually was a pretty good guy. He really was a good government leader. What he did is he finally he said, look, we've got too much territory. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're looking up there, this, this is oops, oops. See, uh, the Dosius Hispanum. We've got Spain, we've got France, we've got the Lowlands, England, Germany. Uh, actually, that would be Austria, Switzerland, Italy. Uh, that would be Greece. That would be part of Turkey. There, were, there, were, there was all these countries. It was huge. And we got down, we have Egypt, then, all, then North Africa. That's a lot of territory to cover. So what Diocletian did is he split it into four sections. Two major emperors and two minor ones. So, and they ruled separately, like this shows here. The Tetrarchy did not work as intended, but would help save the empire for a little while longer. In the beginning, there was always assassinations of war that were normal. Most emperors would not live more than a, few, a year to being assassinated. 
but the tetrarchy was created so that people can manage their parts of it much more effectively. Not a bad idea. Now, this is kind of where Constantine comes in, which is our next guy. Constantine came the latter half of the third century. Oh, fought in the latter half of the third century. So he basically fought like in the, in the, in the upper 200s uh, against the Germanics, the barbarians. He also, if I remember right, he was also in, in the wars in England. The guy was, went around, camp, or campaigns in Britain. He did a lot of traveling. Constantine did a lot of stuff. Constantine began, as most emperors do, as a general. Most emperors began from the military. That's where they got their stuff from the military from. However, he did a lot of political rambling. And after, and I'm not going to go into the, the, how, how, all the stuff he did, but the thing is, after another civil war, and let me tell you, civil wars were common in Rome. OK, we had one civil war, and it was devastating. These guys had a lot of civil wars. They were going after each other all the time. Keep that in mind for the fall of the Roman Empire. However, he became emperor, because his dad was emperor. But in 312, he became emperor. And right before that, he battled against, he battled against a guy who says Maxentus. Okay? I'm not going to go much into it, but there, a lot, it was a pretty bad battle. But he won. So, but what happened in his battle against him is what changed everything. Constantine uses the Cairo. It's not really known how this happened, but what happened, but as for somehow Constantine said, or we hear he said that he had a vision that there was a vision of this, of like, that said in this, in this name or in this symbol, you need to fight your battles. Now, and the word was Kai and Ro. Basically, what that is, is you can see, basically, is Kai and Ro were used in the word Christos, in Jesus, Christ. So the first two letters are, letters, are let, Greek letters for Christ. So what he did is he put those two letters on his flag, and he won the battle. I know that's a very short explanation. There's a lot more happened than that, but he won the battle. The key was is that he said, wow, if this God helped me, then maybe they're not so bad. So what he ended up doing in 313, after the battle, is he, he legalized Christianity. Constantine legalized Christianity. Didn't make it the, didn't make it the, the, empire, the empire's religion. He just legalized it. Now, let's not think that Constantine was a great guy. He, was, he had some problems, and we'll get into that. All right, so he, he went and set the Edict of Milan, which is in 313, basically legalizing Christianity. Eusebius, this, there was, which is a major historian, Christian historian, speaks of the guy as Moses. Eusebius, go, oh, he gushes about the guy. Oh, he's the greatest guy in the world. We've learned since then, he wasn't the greatest guy in the world. He wasn't bad. There, he did do some smart things, but he also did some bad things. Constantine's life... Basically, would end up move, he would end up moving to now what is Turkey. And he would name the cap, his capital over his part of the, of the empire Constantinople. After him, of course. Well, I mean, well, what else would we want to call it other than, well, I guess he just named Constantinople. Hmm, Constantine, Constantinople. It sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, he liked himself. Well, the thing is, it will last or outlast the Roman Empire by a thousand years. So his end of it. Constantinople will remain for a thousand years. That's what we're going to find out next week in the fall of Roman Empire. The Roman Empire itself, the whole empire didn't fall. Only the western part of it did. The eastern part, where Constantine is, continued on for another thousand years until 1453, when, when the Muslims took over. So, he had a bad side. He murdered his son and his wife. Nice guy. Well, I don't like our wives, you know, let's just get rid of them. You know, well, we're going to find out in the Protestant Reformation that King Henry VIII had a problem with that, too. He had a little problem with that, too. So we can't say much good things about him, either. But the key with Constantine, he was not baptized until right before his death. So his death was in around, I think it was 330, 332, something like that, 333. He never got baptized till then. So the thing is, people, I think people say, well, he was a Christian, was a Christian? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
All right, but one thing he did do was something phenomenal that we've been talking about for weeks, the Council of Nicaea. What happened was the Arianism, remember the guys who said Jesus is a lesser form of God, he's not God? Now remember, if you were, if you were here last week, we talked about who is God. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. God came to earth as man. He had, because only God could die for us because he's the only perfect one. Mary was not perfect, although the Catholics believe she is. She's not perfect. Nobody else is perfect but, but God himself. So only he could come and die. Now, the Arians say, no, nah, not really. I think that, uh, you know, he's just a lesser form. God's creation. As if, because here's the point. One of the big problems is, is that with Arianism is the fact that Arianism they thought that why would God come to earth? That would be dumb. He would just send someone else. I mean, what better way to do it? I'm not going to die, but well, why don't you go ahead and go and die? That would be nice of him, yeah. But our God did die. Our God did. He, he came himself. Arianism was wrong. God didn't, God didn't send someone else. God himself came. Now, so what happened was Arianism was actually shaking up the empire. Because people really thought, because you've got to remember, they were still very polytheistic. The majority of people believed in polytheism, the Roman gods. So now you're going to look into Jesus, and you don't just give up thousands of years of, of polytheism to just believe in Jesus. It's not that easy to give all that stuff up. So there was problems. So what happened in outcome of Nicaea? Well, what happened was, and I actually go into a lot of de detail on this in the thing, we talk, I talk about how many bishops were there and all the different parts, what parts of the country were there, but I go into all that. But the key is, what happened in Nicaea was, first of all, Arianism was banned from the church. The role of the clergy, pastors and teachers, what were the clergy supposed to do? This was not bad, not great, because the problem is we started giving more power and more power to the clergy. And it turned out to not be a good thing. Again, in the beginning, it was like, okay, it's not bad what you're doing. But they didn't realize how much power they actually are going to end up with. But more than anything else, the creed was confirmed. They also confirmed the date of Easter. Easter, the same Easter we celebrate now, the times we do, came up from those guys in 325. Isn't it amazing? 1,700 years later, we're still doing what that creed did. We still believe the creed that they went into. We still have Easter like those guys. It's amazing how much this was a very good thing. So Constantine is the guy who brought that about. Okay, made him do it. All right, one of the problems though that Nicaea did is now we have a problem with the church and the state. We're going to from now on deal now. We don't just look at the church, you've got to look at the state. Because the state now has an interest in the church. Constantine showed it. Constantine came and said, I'm going to be a part of this. Now, was it a bad thing? No, it probably helped in the time, but the problem is, again, we start with these small things and it starts growing. One of the big problems we're going to see in when we get to the Protestant Reformation is the state is so powerful they're going to kill you if you don't believe what they tell you to believe. Protestantism was not easy to get to. But I'll tell you, Protestants didn't get, as bad, get it as bad as the other guy. Who were the other guys along with the Protestant? What, what um, I guess, call them denomination, would be pro more, more persecuted in the beginning than Protestants? Anybody? I'm sorry? No, 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 that's not, no, not there, we're not, no, not Muslims. What? Anabaptists, yes, Anabaptists. The Anabaptists are the guys that says, hey, we're going to, we're going to baptize, gonna ba you need to be baptized in Christ, not just as a baby. Anabaptists will be killed in mass. Because in the beginning, Lutherans didn't baptize, didn't do that yet. They were going to, all, all Protestant denominations will now baptize afterwards. But in the beginning, they just thought it was a baby. And so Anabaptists came and said, no, we need to be baptized again. And they were, and the state 
had everything to do with them, killing them. It was very bad. We'll get into that in the Protestant Reformation, though. So we'll speak more of this later. All right. Should we look at some Christians better than others? Anybody? Should we? Because now, are, are some Christians, do, do God, does God favor some Christians more than others? Well, Romans 2.12 says God does not show favoritism. Now, that was a big problem in the early church. They believed that some people are up here, especially the clergy. People go to Catholic church, what do they think of the priests? They know everything. If I don't understand something, I'm going to the priest. I got to go to the priest, got to go to the priest, got to go to the priest, got to go to the priest. And this whole, whole thing, Nicaea also started increasing the power of the priest. The, the word, the name priest actually started coming around this time. Again, not, every, not all the church fathers agreed, but it was definitely there. So the key was is that God does not show favoritism. When I, when I was in the, when I was in the uh, charismatic church, they have a real problem with favoritism. Because their pastors slash reverends slash preachers, whatever you're going to call them, are way up here. And people almost worship them. How do we know this? Why are they driving $300,000 cars? I'm not kidding. Guys like T.D. Jakes. Guys like Dennis Leonard. Marilyn Hickey. If you ever want to, you want to watch, you want to watch the most disgusting thing about that, watch, there's a thing on YouTube, and type in the apostle. And what it is, is a guy who, who they were actually, uh, a, one of these leader, church leaders, who was wearing $5,000 suits, $300,000 cars, $2 million homes, because all they have to do is, they're so important, people like throw money at these people. So the key is though, that's not what we're supposed to do. God does not show favoritism. One Christian is not better than the others. It doesn't matter. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mary's not up there. The saints aren't up there. I like what the Westminster Confession of Faith says, the Presbyterians. Presbyterians, they're good, smart guys. This is what they say about the saints as a biblical role. All saints that are united to Jesus Christ, their head by his spirit and by faith, have fellowship with him and his grace. That's all of us. We're all there. Suffering, death, resurrection, glory, and being united to one another in love. That's what we're here for. The church, united together in love. They have communion with each other and others' gifts and graces. Elders, they have great gifts and graces. Teachers, Jeff, Ryan, Isaac, they have gifts and graces, and so do all of you. You're all important, every one of us, because the body of Christ needs you. Every single one of you, you have gifts for the body. We in the body of Christ, the idea of a saint is basically we're part of the church. The church is the most important thing. The bride of Christ. They are obliged to perform such duties, public and private, as do conduce their mutual good. Basically, you're here. We need to give our good in ourselves for the church, for the mutual good of all. And if we're actively um, doing that in church, then we are doing and fulfilling the very essence of what God instructed us to do as to conduce to the mutual good both in the inward and outer man. I think they're right. We're here to, as the church is the most important thing in Christ. And we come to church. We're here for each other. If we're not giving, if you're not giving of yourself in the church, then, then the church is hurting. We need you. If you don't know, I'm going to tell you. Go talk to the elders. They got, they got this stuff. I've, I've met with them on this stuff. These guys know their stuff. They can help direct you on where to give. And everybody has something to give. If you give me just no, another minute, I'm, I'm almost done preaching here. So, but the key is the elders can direct you. Because 
in the beginning, the communion of saints, what they saw, talk about in the creed. Now remember, I'm sure everybody read the creed. And by the way, I will tell you, if you're not reading these and you're not watching the videos, please do. Because I promise you, it helps you to understand. But the key is in the creed, it says the communion of saints. That's what we're here today for. We are the communion of saints together in Christ for the benefit of the body. So what should we do with, with Christians that walk away from the faith? This is my last slide, almost done. Some sins, sins were considered more egregious than others, bad, worse than others. What if a Christian murdered a fellow church member? Should we allow him back? What if a male a church member with a large family ran off with a younger woman, leaving the children and wife destitute? Should we allow him to come back? What if a pastor preacher became a homosexual and left the church to lead another fa church favorable towards his choice? Should we allow them to come back? These members then desire to return to communion of the church. Would you bring them back? And I'll just leave that. What do you guys think? I will just finish with this. What do you guys think? Should we bring these people back? What, 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 what conditions? Repent, turning away. Now, basically what you guys just said, what you all agreed with, is exactly what Cyprian did, and that's exactly what the church did, in a sense. They started having them do specific things. Started having them do activities. Our fathers, Hail Marys. That's what the church, now, what, but the key is, is that repentance basically means turning back and saying, look, I was wrong, and they begin to act their life correctly. And I think that's exactly what you guys are getting at, isn't it? Not that we want them to do all these things. Go say the prayer 25 times and you'll be, because that's what happened in the early church, in a sense, not everywhere, but in early church. All right. Is there any questions? Philip's like, is he over? Oh my gosh. <laughs> he goes, I can't do this much longer. <laughs> I love Phil. All right, guys. Thanks so much. So next week, make sure you read this. Please read this and, next, and watch the videos and we'll get going next week again.